Hello everybody, it is Ebontis, and today I want to talk to you guys about Dragon's Dogma 2, and hopefully this is just going to be a good beginner's guide of a lot of little tips presented to you in a very spoiler-free fashion. So anything that I show you guys, you should be pretty safe to watch without getting any story spoilers. I'm not going to explain, you know, crazy in-game vocations or anything like that. This is a bunch of little things to smooth out the early part of your journey. Whether it be an advanced tips guide or vocations guide or anything else for me, let me know what you want to see in the comments below because, you know, when it comes to the other stuff, there's a lot to cover in here. But as for this one, spoiler free beginner's guide covering a lot of basics to help your journey be a little bit smoother because there's a lot to take in in this game. It's very cool, but it does not hold your hand. So hopefully this smooths some early stuff out. So let's jump into all of these tips and hopefully you learn something. The character creator is extremely in-depth in Dragon's Dogma 2, and you can make some really cool, like, look-alikes of a lot of faces, and I've seen some crazy ones out there, you can look them up on the internet. But one thing you really actually want to take into account for is in the body settings, how tall you are, how much muscle you have, and then you'll see the corresponding weight down below, will actually affect certain things about gameplay. So if you are a bigger, stronger individual, you're going to be a little slower moving around, but you'll be a little harder to be knocked over. You're going to be able to hold more weight in your backpack without being like over encumbered to the point of being heavy and slowed down. But on the other side, you are going to use stamina probably in a faster way. If you go sprinting uphill, you're going to be slower to recover your stamina. But also if you're very tall and long legged, you actually run faster. You straight up will just like both running speeds different if you have long legs versus short legs. And on the other side, maybe you're playing a thief or something. You want to be more nimble and jumping around. You can make your pawn big, giant, stocky warrior person, or even they could just be a mage standing in the back, but they could be, you know, big and tall, and they can hold a lot more encumbrance for you to help kind of balance out more of a nimble play style. So just keep in mind that a lot of the settings of both weight, size, length of your legs, and, you know, your muscle mass that kind of plays into weight and stuff like that actually will affect how the game is going to play and feel. But if you want to embody a big giant hulking warrior, you can just know that it's going to come with other pieces of effects to the game, like, you know, stamina usage and inventory capacity and all of that. So it's a lot to think about, but just take those things into consideration when you make your character. And at least that way, you know them going in. When it comes to your quest log, you're going to see a couple of different things. So the example I'm showing on screen here is the fact that a quest has both two things flashing. One, the fact that it's time sensitive. When you're heading out on quests, if it's time sensitive and you let a few days pass or even it goes from day to night time, I'm not sure how fast some of them work. But if you let enough time pass, the consequences are going to take place that may not have happened if you did it quickly and the outcome of the quest will be different. So if something is time sensitive and you're able to try and go tackle that as quickly as possible to likely get the best outcome. But you also notice the other flashing thing is the hand that is next to the quest. Your pawns have a lot of knowledge about quests and they're able to actually bring you information from other players, other experiences they've been on. Maybe you're just going through another playthrough and if it's a blue hand, it's your pawn. If you've hired other pawns and it's a one or a two, those pawns will have information about those quests and you can use them in kind of a cool way to bring knowledge from other players' experiences into yours and they can help you find random stuff as well. So pawns are extremely helpful and the quest log will kind of show if they're gonna bring benefit to you, but don't miss out on those time sensitive quests. Those you need to do quickly, otherwise you're gonna miss probably the good benefit of doing them. So on a slightly different note, obviously you're playing this game, so I know you enjoy some action combat. Um, sometimes you might wanna handle a little more strategically though, kind of do your battles in an optimal way. And I know you're not gonna be at your PC or console all the time, so, how about I show you another game real quick that you can take with you on the go when you leave the house. It's got a PvE campaign that you can work your way through, boss rush battles, clan battles, and more for your clan, and new content all the time like live PvP battles, an online lore series on YouTube, a new rarity of champions that can actually morph between two different forms to mix up your team composition and battle, and a new in-game mode called The Cursed City with 100 stages to challenge even the most stacked of teams. All of that is free, and since the game is celebrating its five year anniversary, they're doing something really cool for new players. So if you download and start playing Raid right now, you'll actually get an epic champion Lady Atessa, 500,000 silver and more for just logging in. When you do log in, if you use promo code FESTIVAL5, you'll get another 500,000 silver and another epic champion, this one Tayrell. That's a million silver and two champions just for trying it out. If you get up to level 25, you'll get another 500,000 silver and some more bonuses. 
right kind of when you need them at that level. So if you're looking for a new game to take with you on the go that is free, use my QR code or the link in the description to make sure you get all the bonuses I listed. And when you get in game, look me and my clan up under Ebontis, and you might be able to grab one of those last few spots so we can take on one of the giant clan bosses with millions of health. Those battles get crazy. All right, now back to the guide. Now, with it, without spoiling too much, if you pick up a boulder or an explosive barrel and you throw that at rubble that's blocking an entrance or something along those lines, you might be able to actually accomplish quest objectives or open an area that you may not have been able to otherwise. So picking up and throwing objects, one, you can hit enemies with them. You might be able to knock things over or out of the sky, even though that's pretty tough because harpies are hard to hit. But... Maybe you just need to throw a rock or an explosion at a part of a cave entrance that looks a little different. The texture isn't quite matching the rest of everything. And you might open a cave that you otherwise might not have seen. So throwing big objects at those walls and other things can have some benefit. So try it occasionally. Now, when it comes to quests, the way you get quests is different than other games. There's not just like, hey, you've got quest markers at this person and this person and this person. Not really how it works. So what you're going to need to do is wander around and two things are going to happen. One, if you walk down this way in kind of the opening part of Melv, this little girl is just going to stop you and she's going to ask you for help. That is how a decent amount of the quest actually will begin is bumping into the person who needs to talk to you. So you will just kind of sometimes need to just run around and explore and get close enough to a person so you can have that interaction kind of initiate. Now, the other thing you might need to do is sometimes you might just need to talk to somebody. It could be a vendor, it could be somebody out in the world doing something. But if you talk to people, just initiate that conversation with them. Sometimes that's how you're going to get a quest that you may otherwise miss. So you're going to want to talk to a lot of people. You're going to want to explore the towns pretty thoroughly to try and find as much as you can. And that way you can, you know, go on more quests if that's what you're looking for. As you explore the map, you're going to realize a couple of things. You'll see some markers on it where you have like campsites and things like that. Um, and as you explore, sometimes you'll be heading into areas where you haven't uncovered the fog, but you should still be able to follow some of the major roads, even through the fog. They might be hard to see, but even if you're just like main road and then this little smaller road goes over here. So I'm going to mark here at one cause I know I need to turn left. And then from here, if I put a marker at two, at least if I head in the general direction of the two on my mini map, I'm going somewhat the right direction for what may be a quest marker in this area. And then when I get here, it might have a big circle that I need to explore this area and figure something out. But at least I can kind of guide myself there. Follow the main path until I hit one and then go this direction and then you should probably be okay. Sometimes there's not even marker on the map and you just need to read the quest description to figure out what your next objective is because sometimes it's not sp destination specific but those probably take a little bit more reading and then sometimes if you go to your quest if you're not entirely sure highlight that as a priority and then if your pawn knows about this one or the second pawn that i hired knows what to do on this one they might take over and be like hey if you want to follow me for this quest i will guide you there and they'll usually pretty much take you straight where you need to go because having the little hand up there means they have knowledge about the quest and they can pretty much take you through it so whether you have pawns that are going to help you, your pawn, or just using the map, quests are going to take you a little bit of exploration, a little bit of trial and error. But overall, the questing is cool because it's these adventures you go on. And then when you figure them out, kind of cool. And then other people get your knowledge as well. So the game is big. Don't get me wrong. It's really cool, but it is massive. And traveling around a lot is going to be on foot. That's just part of what the adventure is. You're going to run into a lot of combat encounters that way. Occasionally it gets a good vantage point, so you can kind of see how big this place actually is, which is really cool. But traveling by foot can require a decent amount of time. So one of the things that you're going to get are fairy stones. Now the thing is, you're not going to get to use these very often. So I recommend using them quite sparingly if possible. So you have to set a port crystal first. You either find them in major locations, or you will actually find port crystals that you can place somewhere in the world as a permanent fast travel point. It's up to you to choose where they go. Now, when it comes to fairy stones, they cost about 10,000 gold. So those are not going to be cheap. So when it comes to port uh, fairy stones and traveling by port crystal, it's pretty rare, to be honest with you. Later on, you get to be a little more frequent with them. But for a while, it's pre pretty limited. So what I do recommend traveling on foot a lot of the time, it, when you get to a major town, put away all of this stuff. Literally, none of this should be with me if I'm leaving a town because all of it should be in storage because it's material enhancements and I can't do anything with it. Elixirs, not a bad thing to have with you because they're not that heavy, but if you have like 20 of one thing, you probably don't need that many because it weighs you down. 
and put all of your food in storage and try and do something with your food. Convert it into potions, turn it into lantern oil. A couple of scrags with you is good for camping. That's not a bad thing to bring, whether it's normal or age. That stuff's okay, but you don't need all of this stuff with you. It should be in storage, turned into something else, and only probably bring in healing potions and valuable stuff with you. None of this should travel except these. So managing your stamina for your travel is just another important piece of your journey. The final thing that's going to happen is you're going to get the chance to travel by ox cart. Those are going to be from major cities. Now, if you take Vernworth, where I'm going from the opening part of the game, this is the major city. You can either go to the left by ox cart and that thing's going to take you down here. You can go to the right and that thing's going to take you up to this first village we went to. Those are the main two places that you'll go and I'm not going to show you the rest because that's for you guys to find out. When you go to the ox cart station, there's a little like signpost. If you go up to it, it'll say wait for the ox cart. When you do that, it'll turn the time of day to the proper time of day for the ox cart to get ready to leave. Then when the ox cart is ready, all you got to do is just kind of walk onto the back of it. There's going to be one of those little rug places to sit down. Sit down on the ox cart. They're going to ask you for a little bit of money. Not much, usually one or 200 gold. It's not bad. And then you'll go on your journey. The thing to know about ox cart travel is the fact that you can be on your journey. Now you can actually sit there and watch the whole journey go. You could like jump on, jump off, pick up loot on the way, grab some random stuff going to be a long journey though so more often than not you're probably going to want to doze off to try and pass the time quicker the thing is you might doze off and you might actually get waken up somewhere about here for example and you might wake up to battle now battle could be against small goblins and you just got to take them out and then the actual ox cart can keep going if it survived and the ox survived on the off chance that you face something bigger like an ogre for example and they smash your ox cart to doom well then you're going to be just on foot and you're going to be hoofing it once again so ox cart's not a bad way to go. Just know the fact that you may get that journey interrupted and you may or may not have an ox cart to travel on if that interruption is big enough or damaging enough to the ox cart. But that is kind of one of the main fast travel ways outside of it. And sometimes it works well. Sometimes you get halfway there, but that's part of the journey. And then on the rest of that on foot journey, maybe you'll find something cool along the way because there's plenty of things to find. There's so much I have not seen in this game, it is not even funny. So travel, those are the main ways, but you're going to get pretty comfortable running around on foot. So remember when I said a character that has longer legs and runs faster? Managing that stamina however best you can, it's going to be a good thing to do. So if you do flag a pawn to help you with a quest, which is a smart thing to do, they can sometimes run ahead if you tell them you just hit the go button for your pawn. But if they get to a point where they're farther ahead and maybe you've stopped or wandered off the path, they will stand up there and absolutely just wave at you. That's kind of a point of like, you need to go in this direction. So if you get a little lost at some point, find your pawn waving at you, and then you'll usually be able to kind of run with them in the quest path that they're taking you to. Ladders in this game will typically take you somewhere. Now, the one that you on see on screen doesn't take you to much, but your pawns will typically point out ladders. Typically, they're going to lead you up to an area where maybe you're jumping across rooftops in a city to go find a chest that you might not get to otherwise, for example. I'm not going to show you that exact one because I want you guys to figure that stuff out. But ladders typically have a purpose because more often than not, they're rarely related to nothing. So whether it's, you know, getting up into a tower or getting to a different location more often than not, besides the one I'm showing you on screen, ladders have a purpose, so check them out. And half the time, the minimap has a little exclamation point, and your pawns won't shut up about them, so you may as well figure it out, so they will. Exploration is typically rewarded. Sometimes just like going down a path, being like, hey, I think I can jump across this little cliff edge, and then going over to the bottom of a cliff, you might find a chest, and you might find a whole bunch of other things out in the world, but exploration is generally going to be rewarded almost everywhere you go. If you need to go up a ladder, as I said, there's typically some reason to go up there. You're going to find something or it's a path to something. If you're jumping up on cliffs and making a retreat back and making some weird like cliff trail journey or something, more often than not, there's something out there for you to find. And the fact that exploration is rewarded damn near every time makes it more worth often than not doing it. Now, one thing that's actually kind of cool, it's not always easy to do, but depending on where your pawns are at, depending on how big of a fall you're going to have, they can't keep you from falling and killing yourself. They will actually get out of the way, so they don't want to get crushed. But if they're at a point where they can stop you from getting fall damage, if you jump to your character and you land in their hands, they will actually catch you and save you fall damage. Now, it doesn't always happen. It's kind of hard to control depending on where you're falling. It's not always going to be something that you can intentionally do. But if you can fall and have one of your pawns catch you, they will save you fall damage. Kind of a nice little bonus if you can line things up. So in your inventory, you're going to have a bunch of stuff. Typically, your bottom is going to be your gear, your weapons, your armor, your rings. 
Then you're gonna have materials that can be used to like enhance equipment. That is stuff you should pretty much just always stick in storage because if you get to a vendor who does weapon or armor upgrades, you can basically always pull from whatever's in your storage. You don't need to have it on you. You're gonna have some elixirs, some potions, your lantern, some lantern oil. Your lantern can run out of oil, so you need to fill it up. If you wonder how to make lantern oil without buying it, if you have two pieces of rotten something that you can combine together, you can actually like see two pieces of rotten whatever. You can make lantern oil with that. I'll give you guys that little tip. But also, if you need to make healing supplies, sometimes that's something you wanna do and I wanna make a healing potion or if I wanna make dried fruit, for example, and another herb, I can sit here and make a fruit rubber and so I can do that kind of healing. If I wanna combine fruit together, I can combine two fruit with one and I can make dried fruit. The nice thing about dried items like dried meat, dried fruit, fruit, dried fish, that stuff does not spoil. So it's something you can keep in your inventory, still get the benefit from. And sometimes you can upgrade that into other stuff like this, but at least that way it won't spoil and you can use it when you need it. Things like your big giant pieces of meat, typically that you're gonna have at campfires, those are ones worth keeping, but if they go normal, then they go aged and then they turn, don't eat them but I probably cover that again later. And then you've got other stuff that can modify things to make it even stronger. So you'll do some experimentation because you'll unlock some recipes as you go, but then well, you'll get some things together and pretty much all you can do is like, if you can combine it, try it once and see what happens. And you're, you'll likely get something you need, some more than others with regards to like elixirs and stuff that I used, but you should probably have like one of each type of elixir. So you may as well figure out how to make them. So just start experimenting, but combining stuff in your inventory can serve you very well when you're out in the world, just getting um, healing items just from plants and herbs and fruit in the world. It's a good way to help keep yourself alive. Another piece of advice, check every structure or ruins or building if you're in a town, as long as you're not stealing from royalty or something like that. Basically, if you're in a camp and then there's a chest over here, open it because usually they're okay with that but check all of the buildings because it could be ruins. It might not look like anything's in there, an old busted up cabin. Likely gonna be something inside almost every building. I kid you not, there's stuff in so much. So you're more often than not gonna be rewarded by checking so many of the buildings. Cause even in this camp, you have the one at the top of the hill, come down here, you got another chest at the bottom of the hill. So very frequently you're gonna find chests inside of building type structures. So look in a lot of them and you're bound to find quite a few things. So in some of your exploration, you're gonna find these things called golden trove beetles. And at nighttime, they glow a lot, so they're easier to spot. I do recommend finding pretty much all of these you can because once you pick them up and then you use them from your inventory, you have the ability to actually increase your carrying capacity permanently. And once you start playing the game and you understand encumbrance, you'll know how important this is. So the more of these little guys that you find sitting out in the world, uh, the better off you're going to be. So campsites are a really, really good thing. And some of the early ones are actually just gonna have camping kits right next to them. So if you do see those, pick them up and they're about seven kilograms. So I would spread them between your pawns. But one thing I would advise is before you camp, whether it's day or night, try and clear the area. So if you think up a hill, there might be some enemies. You might wanna go clear those out. You might wanna check down an area. But if you leave enemies up and then you set up camp, you can actually get attacked in say the middle of the night. If you're sleeping through the night, and that can actually cause you to basically lose the camping kit because it gets damaged, then you actually would need to acquire a new one. But typically, if you clear the area and you sleep restfully through the night and you just wake up, you get your camping kit right back. Now, the nice thing about camping versus resting at an inn is when you consume, say, like the aged, like these things, like the aged scrag of beast or whatever, when you actually consume those, you'll notice you can get a boost, a strength boost, a stamina boost, a defense boost, a recovery boost, and you'll get those by consuming these pieces. Now, don't eat anything rotten. That is bad for you. But if you get anything long, like even just a normal beef steak, you can get some good benefits by camping. So while the resting at an inn will give you that specific save point and restore your possible full health, camping out in the world and consuming that food is actually going to be better, especially if you think you have a big battle ahead or you know there's like some big fight that you've got coming up. Use the camping that way. It's actually really beneficial to do. And if you clear the area and your camping kit survives, then you can do it as much as you want with one camping kit. This may be the simplest thing, but if you are in a town, a palace, a city, a place where there are a lot of civilians around, keep your weapon sheathed because if you unsheath your weapon, you cause people to get on edge. 
Now, every blue moon, there might be a reason for that, and I'll let you figure out why that might be. But more often than not, I can tell you, if you are in a town, in a place of royalty, in any place of pretty much importance, where people are on guard especially, keep your weapon sheathed or people are going to get upset. And you will learn because I accidentally did it multiple times and it didn't go well, so keep that in mind. When you're in places of importance, put the weapon away. Now, I'm probably going to say this more times than I mean to, but exploration being rewarded counts for places that you might not expect as well because... Even in a small established camp like this, maybe a town with some ruined buildings or partial buildings or an abandoned town. If there's anything that looks like a structure at all, most often you're going to find chests that you can open and get stuff from. And then if you come down the hill, you might find another chest like right next to a building. And then there's a chest over here. All of these can be opened. A lot of this stuff can be picked up. And unless you're like actually stealing something important in front of a guard or in a very specific area a lot of the times you're going to be okay picking this stuff because it's sitting there glowing at you so check buildings check ruins check all of these places if you're in the middle of like a royal area of a city or something you might be a little more weary of stealing things in front of people but even then it's been pretty rare that it's been an issue but especially out in the world if there's a building there's probably a chest inside so go get it this may be the simplest thing, but if you are in a town, a palace, a city, a place where there are a lot of civilians around, keep your weapon sheathed because if you unsheath your weapon, you cause people to get on edge. Now, every blue moon, there might be a reason for that, and I'll let you figure out why that might be. But more often than not, I can tell you, if you are in a town, in a place of royalty, in any place of pretty much importance, where people are on guard especially, Keep your weapon sheathed or people are going to get upset and you will learn because I accidentally did it multiple times and it didn't go well. So keep that in mind when you're in places of importance, put the weapon away. So another thing you can use this for whatever you think you might have fun with, but the actual wooden bridges, they can be destroyed. So if you knock off just one of their holds, they will break. Now, they will come back after you rest for a few days, and then you'll be able to use them again. But the actual bridge itself typically can be destroyed if enemies are standing on it, if something is trying to follow you. It's actually something you can use as a tool. It's not the most crazy thing, but the wooden bridges, which you'll come across as everything but maybe the big stone ones, they can all be destroyed, and you might be able to use that to, to your advantage. Use that information for what you will. Now, that noise that you hear, it is really hard to miss. It's like a car alarm. Basically what that means is one of your pawns has died. Now, if it is your main pawn, you will always be able to resurrect them, basically adding a rift stone, so it's not as big of a deal. If it is pa other pawns that you have hired, those actually can just kind of leave your instance of your game and you're gonna have to go hire more. So if you leave one on the ground too long, they won't be there, you won't be able to bring them back. If you walk over to them, it's pretty easy to res them. It's just kind of like a little timer that you have to pass through, but Again, if you hear that noise, somebody's down, so try and go find them. Even in the heat of battle, it's better to get them back up, even with partial health. But the other thing to note is your normal pawn, you'll always be able to get back at a rift zone. They're not going to lose any items. Your other two hireable pawns, those are ones that you can kind of lose track of, basically, and have to replace by hiring something else. So when pawns are down, it's good to kind of take care of them quickly. Just a couple of quick things about combat. If I use any of my abilities like this or that, I'm going to use stamina while I do so. So you gotta manage your stamina a little bit. And this is not like a combat guide. That would be a full separate video over vocations and combat and things like that. If you use your main attack, just your kind of small attack, you can do that indefinitely. So if you're trying to regather stamina or trying to be effective, trying to fight enemies that there's a lot of and you're worried about stamina, Focus on that light attack because it can do quite a bit, depending on how fast your weapon is, what you do, and things like that. On the other side, though, you have a heavy attack. So that's like my little jump attack. That's my like kind of forward jump stab. This is just my impale. What I've noticed, at least, and this is on, on melee classes for me, when it comes to bigger enemies, and you'll know the big ones when you see them because you can't miss them, there are instances where if you do enough damage to them and kind of stagger them enough, they will fall. And at those moments, if you can do like a heavy attack, and for me, it was typically like in their head or into a critical point, whatever that may be for the enemy, you're able to do a massive, massive chunk of damage. And it helps quite a bit like lower their health bars because typically they'll have like three or four health bars. 
and that impale, if they're downed, will usually take off half a health bar or more. So if you get the opportunity to run around, find the critical spot, typically their head or it's glowing or something, that can help you quite a bit. Full combat guide, that can come later if you guys are interested in me going in depth on combat, showing like a big ogre fight or anything, I can do that. This is more of just a bunch of little things to smooth out your journey on the way. If you see one of these stones in the wild, it's a rift stone, allows you to use your rift crystals and maybe hire a new pawn, maybe you lost one somewhere along the way, so it's a plate to get pawns out in the world but every time you interact with one you get 30 rift crystals so you may as well interact with them because that's another way to accumulate that currency outside of other means so this is by no means a completely exhaustive guide on everything there's so much to cover in this game but my goal here was to be damn near as spoiler free as i could just to give you guys kind of a tease of some things but really not show off anything spoiler related or location related or story related but I hopefully taught you guys a few things about the game maybe you didn't know, and there's so much more. So if there's certain things you would like me to cover that maybe I didn't in here, whether it's specific or broad topics, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed it, let me know down there as well, or hit the like button. But if you want to find me streaming, it's twitch.tv slash ebontis. I'll be streaming this and also another game that I've got to work on. So I'll be streaming a decent amount over there when I get a chance to play. And if you are new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button, hit the alert bell. That is always appreciated, and thank you all for coming out for this one. And again, check out Raid. It's always appreciated when you guys help support the channel by checking those sponsors out. Have a good one, everybody, and I'll see you soon.